Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show. My name is Nate Bucati. If you're watching us for the first time ever, I don't know how you'll see the screen. <laughs> I guess to my left here is Ali Trost and below me is Carter Augustine. And uh, we're all practicing our social distancing while teleconferencing and connecting with one another. And we're doing the show from our own places now, which also means guys that we've set up our own makeshift studios. I can see that everyone has taken yes. the time to at least have some sort of decorations up for the uh, show. I decided to set up a little table in front of my scarf wall in the basement. As you can see, I don't know if you guys are interested, but uh, on this side, you've got, uh, I'll keep away from the KU stuff. There you go. You got the, all my sporting scarves over the years. And then this way, all the other ones we've, uh, we've got here. So. Very nice. That's a, I try to give it a, a soccer backdrop here at the, uh, at the Bucati household down in the basement while my children are upstairs watching YouTube and playing video games. Uh, Carter, I see that you've got yourself a USA soccer ball behind you, a Swole Park Old Ranger trusty. ball. Yep. What else you got? A, tr a truce? Is that a true soccer ball? That, yeah, we've got the truce. Well go. spotted. Uh, nice. Is that a T-Grace scarf there right next to you? Is who? It is, man. You're on top of it. Yeah, yeah. I've got a few here. Um, Let's go. In my, I got a little. Oh. Yep, there we go. Very nice. Yeah, I. Uh, <laughs> Did you just? I ran out of time. Status. Lost my ears there. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that a scarf wall up above you? Can it you is. Tilt the thing back so we can see it, or without yanking your head. Um, I'm uh, experiencing some technical difficulties. Here we go. All you have to do is tilt it. You don't have to raise the whole thing up, right? If you just tilt it back. <laughs> this is, look at that scarf wall there. Looking good. Looking good. There you go. Beautiful. What, and, and now I have like the saddest scarf wall ever. I've got one <laughs> scarf and I ran out of time. I meant to hang up my U.S. Women's National Team signed jersey. So I've got like, I've got some sports books over here in the corner that I plan actually to read. I stole them from Tom. I, uh, all my books are at my parents' house. So I'm going to try to do some, some reading while we're here throughout the first pitch at, uh, at T-Bones. They had a college D1 softball tournament going on, and they asked me to throw out the first pitch, which is hilarious because, if you know me, my hand coordination is absolutely terrible. So got to do that little commemorative piece of uh, gear from that and yeah my one sad sporting kc scarf so that's what we got <laughs> i like that it's great though because let's be honest you know the two the two males on the show here probably have horrifically uh decorated places overall i'm not gonna speak for carter but at least for me uh, it's pretty bad yeah no you've you're, got you're the very right. nice on. lamp there very nice looking couch you know organized uh mm -hmm. st stand next to the couch and then I, I got like some like greenery, like some fake plants <laughs> yeah. in the background. Like this Very is nice. just. But then you got call the me, Joanna Gaines. Call me. I'll join the show. <laughs> you put up that sporting scarf 10 minutes before we took the air. That's the truth. <laughs> oh, of course. Are you kidding? Hey. I don't like hang. It's funny. I love sports, but I do not hang up like any sports kind of like gear or anything like that. I just I don't I've never done that really. Even when I was little, I had like my shadow box with my women's national team jersey. Tom, on the other hand, has like a museum of just like all things sports. So yeah, this was like my my last minute hey, thing. I, I'm gonna bulk it up next week. It's gonna be even better this we, week. I appreciate the effort. It's good. We got some good stuff going here. So coming up on the show, we actually have a really really interesting chat with Roger Espinoza. I'll go ahead and let you know that we recorded that before we did this segment of the show, that we're kind of going back into the first segment first. But we're gonna play for you a great video conference we did with Roger Espinoza. We're gonna talk with him about what the team's going through right now, what he's going through personally, how this has, uh, has affected them as a team, how he's staying in shape, all of that. Then we're also gonna spend a long form, form segment talking about the 2013 FA Cup championship that he won with Wigan. What a moment in history that was really in the, in the world of soccer. And he was a huge part of it, played 90 minutes in that game, played in a lot of the games in that FA Cup run. Um, and, and I haven't really heard him talk much about that. So we're going to do that with Roger Espinosa coming up. And, uh, and Carter, you've got the, the Honduras uh, jersey on that I didn't notice until about halfway through our interview with, uh, with Roger. Spot on there. Is there a story behind this? Did you, uh, 
Uh, I actually don't remember how I got this, acquired this shirt. Um, I've been to a few USA Honduras games, most of which are a little, a little blurry in my mind, but uh, <laughs> a lot of good memories. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, my first ever USA game was actually USA Honduras at Soldier Field in Chicago uh, in 2009, going to qualify for the 2010 World Cup. And uh, man, that is an indelible moment in my in my life. Uh, I loved soccer up until that point, but honestly, we, me and my buddies went. We uh, stayed in a hotel. You know, we had some beers. We got to take the L to the game and ran into a couple of Honduran guys that were unbelievable and uh, got a picture with them. I mean, we, t- we talked for a long time. It was, it was just a wonderful experience. One guy had a Jerry curl that reminded me of like Roberto Baggio's incredible, nice. incredible lettuce. And um, <laughs> yeah. And then the, we would go to the game and it was 75% Honduras fans. I mean, this is just 2009, mind wow. you. And we were in the upper deck and the whole upper deck at Soldier Field was Honduras fans. Uh, what I mean, and they scored in the fifth minute. Carlo Costa, I remember to go up, and the place went absolutely insane. And uh, U.S. fans were in the minority. It was an incredible experience. Came back and won. Landon Donovan and, and Carlos Bocanegra, but uh, that's my that's my favorite. So Carter Honduras went and actually favorite. bought that jersey at halftime because he was like, I can't be caught rooting for <laughs> the other team. <laughs> oh man, I think we did a jersey swap, maybe. You know? Yeah. 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 Or I was, or I was drunk and bought one of the five dollar cheap jerseys in the parking lot. I, you know, I, I can't remember. <laughs> hey, but, uh, just wanted to give Roger a shout out. Yeah, no doubt. Well, he's going to appreciate that. We know that. Um, real quick, guys, before we take a break and get into the Roger interview, and we we want to have as much time for that as possible because, and by the way, those of you listening on Sports Radio Eight Ten WHB, you might hear an abbreviated version of the interview. If you want to hear the entire in depth thing, you can go to the podcast page at 810whb.com or on the 810 app or anywhere else that you get your podcasts. Uh, You can ask Alexa to play it for you. And, of course, now you can watch our pretty faces on video as well and our wonderful scarf walls and uh, decorations that we have. We've obviously (laughs) gone all out for you to to bring you the best video uh, viewing uh, enjoyment you can have. Um, But real quick, guys, a quick uh, temperature check on you guys, metaphorically speaking. Um, But – it's been a couple of weeks now without any live sports or specifically for our purposes here, soccer. How are you guys holding up Carter? I mean, you know, you're, you're doing the social isolation thing like the rest of us. Uh, how's it been for you so far? Yeah, it's been all right. I've, you know, I've been keeping myself busy. Definitely. Um, I'm a, uh, I'm okay being by myself. So that part hasn't been too difficult. And, uh, but missing the sports, is, it, this thing whole, this thing would be a lot easier with sports. Right. So I think yeah. uh, it's obviously, very small on the scale of important things, but um, it's definitely been, it's definitely been weird. I'm sure uh, just, just for you guys. What about you, Alex? Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. I'm totally cool being like by myself, total homebody. So for me, it's been, you know, I went through that kind of adjustment phase of being home more often than usual. Um, but now that I've got a little at home work setup going on, really enjoying that. Uh, once I run out of like things to do on my to-do list, like, you know, updating my reel, things that you always push to the bottom of the list, um, then I'm going to maybe start itching for, you know, more things to do. But missing sports is definitely number one. I think, you know, just a constant reminder of even seeing replays of like NCAA tournament games, replays. I know that we've had some old Sporting Kansas City games get, you know, played on Fox Sports Kansas City. And even on Sports Radio 810, playing a lot of, you know, memorable games has kind of made me realize, like, I'm ready for some new games. I don't want to, you know, constantly be living in the past. Like, definitely want, you know, those to come back but again like you said Carter it's for the greater good and you know hopefully flattening this curve and getting people healthy staying safe is number one so still uh ask me next week how I'm feeling we might get a different answer but Nate how are you feeling well we will ask you next week because we're gonna keep doing this show yes you know this this whole time (laughs) whatever it takes because people want content like you said Carter that's that's one of the weird things about this phenomenon that we're dealing with right now for example people in my space that you know have having three kids all of a sudden work schedules get disrupted kids don't get to go to school the first place we would usually rely on help would be our parents you know the grandparents of our kids we can't take our kids to see them right now we have to keep our kids away from them so that's one thing that's weird. And then the other thing is when we're shut inside sometimes, if it's bad weather, natural disasters, things like that, 
what's one of the first things we do is, hey, let's watch a ball game. Let's take our mind off it. Let's watch sports. It's, it's like the great unifier and the great distraction for us. And it was like the first thing that was taken away from us in this situation. And I've got to remember to keep my email uh, off on this. So while we're doing this, by the way, guys, we're, we're learning, we're learning. I'm silencing my email now. Sorry about that alert right there. Uh, but so those things are just different. When you ask me how I'm doing, I am not like you guys. I am not a homebody. As you know, I don't shut up. I don't like to be shut in. I like to be, I thrive on human interaction. Um, I'm getting a lot of human interaction with my three children right now, which is, uh, I'd like, I'd like some interaction with other people <laughs> at this point. So we'll see there. It's, I mean, they're great kids and it's, we're, we're making the most of it, but you know, it's, we're, we're all cooped up in the same house trying to make the most of it right now. I don't believe you, by the way, Allie, that you're, a, you're a homebody and an introvert, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm okay. I'm not it's not like either. I'm a home, I'm an introvert and extrovert. Like I love going out doing things I'm I'm with you like human interaction is important for my everyday life but I also do enjoy like my personal space and I think for me having like finally gotten that set up over the weekend again it's only been now like what is today Tuesday I got this set up on like Sunday <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's been like two or three days of enjoying it half of the week last week I was actually in the station so just enjoying it for the time being. And I can't wait to like go to a restaurant again. I know it's like such a small thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I was thinking about that recent, recently. I was like, wow, how weird not to be able to just go out to eat. Like yeah. just a common yeah. thing that everyone does. Um, and just, you know, getting back to normal will be nice when that happens. But for right now, trying to take the time and, you know, focus on things that you can only really focus on when you are literally in isolation. So yeah. And well, I'm trying back to, to what Ali said, check in a couple weeks and um, we'll see. And unfortunately, you know, people we need also don't have get... kids either Carter. Yeah. So. That's uh, <laughs> important I think it'd be a little there. different. Yeah. Um, I think importantly as well, right. People need content to get through, but this thing could get a little more serious. Um, we're starting to, you know, see some, some sad reports and, I know it's touched the soccer world a lot. I think I saw a former president of Real Madrid contracted the uh, COVID and, and, and passed away. And um, hopefully, you know, everyone out there is, is safe. And I think what Ali just said, going to a restaurant, um, I'm thinking of like all the ripple effects on everyone throughout in, in the entire country, the people that work at restaurants and, and all that. And um, yeah, uh, hopefully uh, we could talk a little soccer and take some mind off what could, could get pretty serious. It, well, I mean, it already is pretty dang serious, yeah. obviously. Yeah, but, but it probably hasn't really hit here in Kansas City as much as what they're saying it's going to. So we got we to gotta hunker down. But at the same time, people need a little distraction every once in a while, a little mm -hmm. uplift. And that's what we're going to do. And the good thing is we've got a, 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 an organization, a club here in Kansas City, loaded with guys who have done amazing things and have amazing stories to tell. Some of them maybe you've heard a little bit of before. Some of them you haven't. But we're going to not run out of stuff to talk about with all these guys. And I'm just here to tell you, you're going to hear this interview we, we've done with Roger Espinoza next. And you're going to hear stuff that he'll tell you about the FA Cup you've never heard before. Stories that he said he's never really been asked about before because he's done so many other things in his career uh, that you're really going to want to hear it. You're going to enjoy it. And, and we're going to take some of these deep dives to things that we haven't had time to do in the past because – it's a, it's a game next week. There was that immediacy at all times of the Sporting Kansas City show was about what was going on at that point in time. And so this gives us an opportunity to take a breath and really take a look back at some of the incredible characters we have around us. So it's going to be a lot of fun to hear from Roger Espinoza here in a minute. You're going to want to hear that interview. But guys, before we do that, Carter, you came up with an idea. We're going to ask Roger about this as well. And I love this. We're all trying to kill time at home right now. We're looking for some stuff. Uh, online, maybe videos, some sports to, to consume. So tell me about this idea, and we're just going to have to come up with uh, one or two examples here uh, before we take a break and go to Roger. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, it's going to be great hearing from Roger on this, and hopefully a few more people down the line. Um, apologies to Allie for uh, not stepping up to the plate and some of the challenges uh, she sent over to, to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess this is another I'm one. I'm so of annoying. In, in <laughs> no, no. I'm, is, I'm not There's good two at types of people in the world. There's the type of person <laughs> that cannot wait to join every social media challenge, and then there's the person that, that 
not wanting to be a part of every social media challenge. And I'm somewhere in the middle of those two. And uh, <laughs> I like the enthusiasm, yeah. Allie. I like it. She's, a, she's, you got a challenge for it's her. Fun. She's in. <laughs> I'm down. Let's do it. Except I've got, I've got a running list now of some that I have yet to do. So maybe I'll do that tonight. There you go. Yeah. I, I, I like the enthusiasm as well. Uh, you know, uh, good in other people. Uh, well, oftentimes I don't, I don't have the same. <laughs> I have the same enthusiasm, but uh, I'm enjoying what everyone else is putting out there in the world. And, um, but, you know, like you said, Nate, we're here at, at home trying to spend some time and uh, you two wormholes. I think we talked about this on uh, last week's podcast, but they can be a beautiful thing. Um, but as soccer fans, right, what's better than a goal highlight? And um, I'm curious just to get some of some people's uh, perspectives and, and we can just start building the a big list of uh, can turn into a YouTube wormhole for you to go through history and look at some, some incredible goals. So goals, goals to Google, um, basically just going to ask, you know, what, uh, what's a goal that you would tell someone to Google and why is it so significant to you? So Al, you want to go first on this? Yeah, I'll go first. So, you know, unfortunately, and hopefully I'll have this for next week, but I was trying couldn't find my high school highlights. So sorry, guys. I know a lot of you were dying to see those. But uh, I was trying to find some highlights of my great uncle Al Trost and his time playing professional. It was a quite a bit of time ago, so I wasn't able to find anything yet. But that is my homework assignment for next week is to try to find some for you guys to look up uh, some of his goals or best moments. Um, but one goal to Google that I found, Peter Vermees, the manager of Sporting Kansas City, had an amazing goal, U.S. men's national team against Costa Rica. It was July of 91, the CONCACAF Gold Cup. He opened the scoring in the sixth minute. Beautiful head ball goal. He patiently waits behind the defender, sees the cross coming, creates distance, and then just with so much power, knocks it in. And the men's national team ended up trailing that game and then eventually came back and won it 3-2. to two. So Vermees' goal ended up being very important in that game. And uh, it, was, it was a good one. So just Google... U.S. men's national team versus Costa Rica. Again, July of 1991, CONCACAF Gold Cup, and you will see manager Peter Vermees, who it's, the quality is not great, but he looks the exact same. So look it up. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> That's good. Okay, so for me, I came up with a couple, but I'm only going to give you one this week because I figured this is something, like you said, Carter, we can keep doing as time goes on. Um, for me, the, this was a goal in the 1998 World Cup. Uh, France versus Croatia in the semifinals. France versus Croatia kind of rings a bell, doesn't it? Yeah. And mm -hmm. that was for me personally because I'd never traveled abroad in my life. In 1998 was the summer of – I had just graduated college. And, and for spring break my senior year, I went to Paris, France, to visit a gal that I was dating at the time. And everything was World Cup everything. You know, leading up, it was a couple months before the World Cup. So I kind of adopted France as a team to cheer for in that World Cup. And so I watched all their games. And Lillian Taram scored two goals in that semifinal to, to have a come-from-behind win because Croatia scored first. He got a two-to-one win. And in the 70th minute, he scored a goal with his left foot that he curled inside the far post on a good build-up play down the right side. And it's not one of the best goals you'll ever see in your life. But the moment was so massive because that was on French soil. You know, they would go on to win the World Cup in their home country, uh, which was such a special thing. But it was the image of that World Cup that always stood in my head because he scored the goal. And when he went to take the shot with his left foot, he was outside the penalty area. He dropped to his knees and he kind of, he just went like this from on his <laughs> knees, like he was stunned at his own strike and his whole team came and gathered around him and um, that was one of my, that was like, that was the image of the 1998. Everybody remembers Zinedine Zidane and how amazing he was in that world cup. But for mm -hmm. me, I, I didn't know who Lillian Taram was, to be honest with you before that I just graduated college. So look up Lillian Taram scored a brace in the semifinals of the 1998 world cup. What's the great fact about that Nate too, is he's a defender played 142 games for France. Incredible player. Yeah. Wow. Two goals. Yep. Wow. Two game. goals in the 142 game in 142 games for France. And, that, and it won them the semifinal on their home mm -hmm. soil. How about that? That's right. Yeah, that's, All right. What about you, Carl? Awesome. Yeah, for me, I, like you said, Nate, tough to just grab just one, but uh, hopefully we can keep this going. And um, we're talking with Roger Espinosa about an FA Cup final today. So I wanted to talk uh, about a goal from an FA Cup final. My favorite player, Steven Gerrard. They call it the 
the uh, the Gerard final, and in in uh, in England, it's like an ultimate honor to have an FA Cup final named after you. There's only a handful of them throughout the the very long history of of uh, the FA Cup final, and it was Liverpool West Ham in 2006. Uh, Gerard wound up having two goals and an assist in, in a 3-3 game that they wound up winning on penalties, and um, they went down two nothing. They went down. Let's see, two nothing, I believe. And then he gets the the assist on the first goal. The second uh, goal is a is a wonderful goal as well, a knockdown in the box that he hammers into the corner. But the the third goal, down three two, it's the 90th minute. You literally hear the PA announcer uh, in the stadium go four minutes of added time <laughs> as the ball is crossed in. It gets knocked back to about. 36 yards, 37 yards out. You can tell by the cut of the grass. And on a couple bounces, he just absolutely smacks it. It's on a frozen rope. Past Shaka Hislop, who does a lot of media here in the U.S. You know, he's playing in goal that day for for uh, West Ham. Um, I'm curious to see what uh, – I don't think I've ever seen his remarks about it because it was from a long way out. But I think he got shielded by a couple guys, and, and he just absolutely hits it. And uh, the call is famous because – I think it's Martin Tyler talking about the same thing. You hear the, you hear the PA announcer four minutes at a time, and right as he does it, he hits it. Martin Tyler goes nuts. And, uh, it, I mean, it's just an incredible equalizing goal, and they wound up uh, winning, the, winning the cup final, and one of my favorite goals of all time. All right, so Stevie G, you know, they should have named the FA Cup of 2013 after Roger Espinoza. <laughs> we could do that at least on our show. We're going to talk about that with – Roger Espinosa, but we're going to share those goals to Google. We'll make it a hashtag. When we tweet out this podcast and everything, we'll put it out there. Well, maybe we can each put our links up to, uh, to the goals that we're talking about so people can look at them. And, uh, and then if people want to, you know, hit us up with some as well, we might share some on the next edition of the show. Yeah. All we'll right. See what let's, everyone yeah, has. Yeah, let's do it. Let's have some fun here. I, mean, I, I don't know about the Stevie G one and, and the Peter Burmese one I've probably seen, but it'll, it'll make me go back and look at it. So, Let's have some fun with this. We're going to take a break, though. When we come back, Roger Espinoza is going to join us. He'll maybe talk about some. We'll get his goals to Google, but also we're going to relive that 2013 FA Cup. This is the Sporting Kansas City Show. Back after this. And we continue with the Sporting Kansas City Show on your home for SKC Soccer, Sports Radio 810 WHB, and wherever you get your podcasts, and apparently now wherever you get your video, too. We'll talk more about that as the show goes on, but we are joined by our special guest on the show now. Of course, we've got Ali Trost, Carter Augustine with us, and now Roger Espinoza joining us from, uh, looks like a, a concrete pillar behind you. Uh, <laughs> That's is, where I live, my home. This is your home, a very minimalist, <laughs> yes, huh, <I> Roger? <laughs> How you I don't doing, get much. I'm good, I'm good. Just uh, a little in quarantine here, but uh, it's, it's not too bad, you know? So you told us before we started that you just got done working out. So what is the routine like for you, for players now? How are you guys staying in shape during this whole uh, shutdown situation? You know, thankfully, the city still allows you to go outside and run. So, um, you know, that's pretty much what I do. I, you know, just set up my uh, garment just to take me to the streets pretty much. I set it up for three or four miles, five miles, whatever you want, and then uh, it kind of gives you a little GPS on where to go, and that's pretty much what I do. The majority of the workout I do here in my uh, concrete jungle. Uh, <laughs> I uh, uh, had some stuff already um, that I work out pretty much. You know, the good thing is that Joey, our performance coach, uh, gave us a lot of um, core works out that you can do at home, and that keeps you a little bit, you know, your – um, you can do your correct as we call it and keep your core strength still going and your cardio, you can go out on the streets and do that. So that keeps us a little bit in shape and, and hopefully, you know, um, it's not much that we have stayed longer uh, at our place and we're able to go get back to soccer. Shout out to Roger. Joey. We he, talked he with gave me a, a, a nice exercise for my lower back. I had some old man problems earlier this year. So uh, shout out to Joey for helping me with that. Yeah, thankfully my lower back, you know, last year I had a bunch of knock on wood, you know, uh, this year has been pretty good. And I think it has to do a lot with all that, um, you know, correctives and get all that stuff done before training and throughout uh, the off season and in preseason. And, you know, uh, thankfully it's, it's gone for me so far. 
Roger, what's been the biggest challenge with trying to stay fit while having to stay inside and not being able to really go anywhere? Has it been hard to maintain a routine? Absolutely. You know, um, it's just because, you know, cardio is one thing, but, you know, playing, stopping, running, cutting, uh, that so comes with playing and competing against your teammates. So that's something we're going to have to see when we get back. Uh, it's difficult, but, hey, we still, you know, we, we were definitely um, – in very good shape at the beginning of the season and hopefully we st that's still maintaining right now but again you won't know until you get back and you are playing again so take us more into this running on the streets thing i mean are we taking our shirt off so all the people can you know check us out and see, <laughs> see, see the soccer bod are you are you running the streets are you going to parks like what, what kind of a run are we talking about here yeah, so yesterday, pretty much, I, I live in Westport, so I took up here and, all, and ran pretty much all the way to Crossroads. Uh, that was about close to five miles there and back. Um, but yeah, no, no taking my shirt off. It's pretty <laughs> cold out there. Yeah. Uh, hopefully we don't get to that point. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's good. It's a good sweat. Uh, I still feel in very good shape. Uh, did as fast as I could. Uh, you know, try to sort it out, but it's uh, it was uh, definitely a, a good workout for me. Raj, take us back to um, when this news kind of went down. You guys, I think it was a Thursday. You guys were still in training, and, and actually, were in training for that Atlanta game um, when the news broke. Take me through kind of finding out um, and, and what that was all like for you guys. Yeah, we, you know, we technically had heard that this is a possibility. Uh, we knew that the San Jose game had been canceled. So we knew that was a matter of time until something was going to be said and it was going to be canceled. Uh, we did not think the Atlanta game was going to be canceled. So we went out there and practiced our normal way. And we were just pretty much getting ready for that game. And we were uh, concentrated and ready. I mean, uh, we started uh, the season in that way. And, you know, we didn't really pay much attention in what was said behind uh, in the background. So we were ready for that game. Uh, after practice, uh, it was brought to our attention from Peter, the doctors, um, and some of the staff that, you know, it all has been um, postponed to a later date. Um, but we were okay with it. We were okay with it just because we knew that, hey, um, you know, it's something that we needed to address and we knew that um, that it was uh, health before anybody, before anything, sorry. And Roger, while it might be, you know, a very difficult time for a lot of people staying inside, trying to adjust to this new way of life, one group that's really benefiting from this is pets everywhere. And you have an English bulldog, <laughs> Chula. What's, what's his reaction been like to having you home more? Yeah, I didn't know this guy barks so much. Now that I'm staying at home, he's barking all the time. I'm like, okay, this is what you do when I'm not home. Uh, he's he, Anything that moves, I, I think because it's so quiet and, you know, I live in Westport, it's a little bit louder in this area. It's everything, all the buildings are next to each other. So you can't hear, you can't really hear, can't hear much. But um, now that everybody's gone, it's all these noises and he's barking at everything. But he's definitely confused on why am I home so much. But uh it's great to be home and hang out with him and go on long walks, uh, trying to get him in shape. And by the way, it's, uh, it's his birthday today. So he's turning 11 today. Happy hey, happy birthday, oh. Cholo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so some some uh, Instagram posts are coming. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. He's 11 he today. I got him my second year uh, uh, at the Wizards at the time. Uh, oh he definitely, he's definitely loving me being home. Usually, uh, in the past few years, I've been traveling. Uh, when it's his birthday. So, hey, we get to celebrate Aww. it today. You know, there have been these little positives like that. I mean, obviously, there's so much has, has been <coughs> negative about this whole situation. But I think all of us have found ourselves enjoying our home space a little bit more and finding a way to get the most out of it, whether it's – for me, it's the kids. I'm spending a lot more time with them right now, finding different creative ways to entertain them with you. And Chulo, you know, you guys are spending more time together. He's not a runner, though. Right at 11 years old, you can't take him out on a five-mile run, can you? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. The most we can make is about two blocks, and he wants to walk back now. <laughs> he's kind of stopped and wants to come back. Mark's territory a few times, and he's back. You know, Roger, Roger I did see – Oh, ahead, sorry, Ali. Nate. I, I did see on social media, though, you've been doing a lot of these different stay-at-home challenges. You did the push-up one recently, and Chulo was licking your elbows. He's been 
is he doing any challenges himself? No, he just been he's challenged to sleep all day. Uh, I think he's he's benefiting the most from from anybody. I think uh, you know he's getting treats all the time and just going to sleep. Uh, but yeah, the challenges. I mean, I, I'm telling you, I don't want to do any more. But it's a lot of friends giving me crap about it. So uh, so now when I get a challenge, I don't tag anybody to keep it going because if I change if I challenge those people, they're gonna come back to me with the challenge. So now I kind of slow it down. I mean, I'm already uh, tired of doing all them. Uh, good advice. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I need to do the same thing. I'm, yeah, I'm way behind it's so my mind. many. Yeah, it's so many. <laughs> but it's it's great that uh, you know everybody has a good spirit. Uh, you know, everybody knows that it's necessary to do this to get the uh, uh, not just uh, Kansas City but the entire world back into it. Yeah, I think that's Carter. That's your philosophy, isn't it? You know, you're not. Uh, you maybe you're going to accept the challenge, but not necessarily pass it down. Have I noticed that? Uh, I think yeah, you're, you're probably right. <laughs> I apologize for tagging both of you. <laughs> Allie, Allie is up for every challenge, by the way. She's I'm all over it. Take every challenge, you know, that, that comes her way. And I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, but I will say this, like, the longer this thing goes on, I think I'm going to be begging for challenges and other just stupid things to do to, yeah, to like occupy it. my time. So <laughs> we, we got a lot of time in front of us. We got Roger Espinoza here. And, and to go back to what Carter was talking about when this whole thing came down, Roger, I think it's – it's the kind of thing that you're going to be asked about for the rest of your life. When this moment in time is brought back up, I think the sports world was at the epicenter of everything. I think for a lot of Americans, a lot of people in the world, I think the first time they maybe really realized how serious this situation was, was when the sports world started first playing games behind closed doors. We saw that in Europe with a lot of soccer games. And then it was a matter of days before NBA cancels things, NCAA tournament gets canceled. You're, you're, you know, because sports is where large gatherings happen, right? And and so it was like that was the, that was like the the start of it in a lot of weird ways. Um, I think the sports world was was on the cutting edge of everything that was happening here. And I'm just curious, like for you emotionally, what was that like? I mean, were you trying to not pay attention to it all? Were you were you were you wrapped up in it, or or like when did it kind of hit you that oh man, this thing? You know, this thing is really serious. Uh, from the beginning, I mean, we were in preseason, and we knew that, uh, uh, you know, we took all the precautions. We, got, we had people get sick, uh, but luckily enough, you know, it wasn't anything that had to do with, uh, with the virus. And uh, I think in the staff and the media, I think a few people got, got sick. So, uh, you know, we were, we were definitely cautious about everything that was, that was going on, and uh, we knew that it was coming. I mean, we were all careful. We were all taking all the, uh, the, all the procedures, you know, washing our hands, making sure we were not next to our teammates, uh, isolating teammates when they got sick. And then we got to Vancouver and we even f took all the precautions on the flights and we knew it was coming. We were paying attention. Uh, and then the, all of a sudden, a couple of weeks into it, we knew that it was getting, it was, it was a big deal. It was happening in, um, Italy, um, some other countries already stopped. Spain was already asking to to stop. So uh, we were definitely, you know, trying to concentrate on soccer, but at the same time, you know, paying attention to make sure that everybody here and our team and that was around us, our fans and media, that everything was uh, okay. And once we saw that, you know, we were all in danger, that it was it was it was the time for us to stop. By the way, Carter, nice, nice, nice jersey. I didn't see your jersey. Right? Yeah. I, you know what? Hey. I, when I saw the stripes yeah, at first, I, I couldn't you couldn't see the logo. I wondered if it was a Riados uh, shirt, and now nope. you, you can see the Honduras baby. Nice, <laughs> nice. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you know that we were able to take the right measurements at the at the right time. I know one thing Nate was talking about things that have kind of uh, popped up since we've all been at home. I know my group chat has been just exploding. I'm wondering if the uh, if the team group chat, if there's some shenanigans going on, uh, what are you guys doing to stay in contact with each other? I mean, yeah, we have enough guys that uh, get that going and keep everybody in good spirits. Uh, I mean, I don't even need to mention a couple that you guys already know. Uh, you guys can give me two names and I'll agree with you guys. That, yeah, definitely those guys are uh, getting the group going. It's good spirit. I mean, in these times, you need that. And um good that we are, are in the world of sports and we'll have colleagues all over the country and your teams here in Kansas City. And uh, it's, it's awesome to see what the, the things that the guys come up with. 
it's a lot of smart guys can come out of this. <laughs> so Johnny Okay, Russell. give us the names for people who might not know who you're talking uh, about. Just, who I'll, talking I'll, about? I'll, I'll give you one name, and you guys already know what that name is. Uh, Russell is one of the yeah. guys that keep, <laughs> keep in the team spirit really um, great. So I'm uh, absolutely glad that we have guys like him in the team. You know, Roger, th this, this obviously goes way down the list. I mean, way, way down the list in terms of the most important things when, when we're dealing with something this serious. But you guys were flying, man. <laughs> like, you know what? We, we were setting records for TV ratings. You guys were scoring goals. The team was looking good. That stinks, doesn't it? I mean, it, and, and you guys are going to have to try to keep the, get that momentum back whenever, whenever this thing gets restarted. Absolutely. You know, it's a, it's a tough situation because we were all ready. Uh, from the minute the season ended last year, uh, we knew that, hey, we had to prepare if we wanted to compete this year and be in the top teams in the league, that, hey, something has to change either, you know, and we, we didn't look at outside the club. We looked at ourselves and said, hey, you know, it's me. You know, everybody went individually and, and, and looked at themselves and said, hey, I have to be better next season. I have to come back ready in preseason. And that's what everybody did. And we started the season that way because everybody came to – to preseason with the mentality that, hey, uh, I'm going to do my job and I'm going to be uh, a team first guy. And we all did that. And this came down right now. But, hey, everybody still proved that, hey, if we work together and we are mentally there, we can, we can, we can achieve great things. Um, and the great thing, hey, it's not just us. Uh, it's everybody in the league in the, same, in the same boat. So at the same time, there's no excuse for us to come back uh, whenever this um, – break is done let's call it that way i mean whenever all the situation is done and we're back hey we're all start at the same time uh the only thing you control right now it's uh, how you prepare when we're back all right so roger we're going to take a break when we come back i thought we'd have some fun since there's no games to talk about this past week reliving one of the biggest moments of roger's career plus Carter came up with a nice, fun idea for things we can do on Google to kill our time, and, and Roger's going to help us with that as well. So that's right after this on the Sporting Kansas City Show. All right, we're back with Roger Espinoza. We've moved spots on the screen if you're watching us on, uh, on video now, but uh, I've got Ali Trost, Carter Augustine, and Roger Espinoza with us, and I thought we'd take a trip down memory lane because we got so many guys on the Sporting Kansas City team that have accomplished some incredible things in their careers, and obviously Roger is one of those guys – uh, winning an FA Cup and also, of course, winning U.S. Open Cups. That's a pretty unique distinction for a player. And I've never really heard you talk much, Roger, about that FA Cup win. When you went to Wigan Athletic, you guys got a 1-0 victory over Manchester City at Wembley Stadium in 2013. We know that that was the same year that Sporting went on to win MLS Cup. We've heard, I've heard you tell that story about watching the, the MLS Cup, but let's go back to the FA Cup itself. First of all, just how would you describe the competition? I mean, in terms of um, maybe, you know, the, I know that in England, maybe it starts to ramp up in importance as you get deeper into it, but what was that, that run like for Wigan Athletic? How big of a deal was it to the community there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you see the FA Cup here in the U.S. and you know it's a it's a it's a great tournament, but you see the later stages a little bit. And you know in England, when I got there, I even saw the magnitude even bigger. How people in your town and everybody just gathers for those games. But for us, you know, the early stages at the time we play uh, the first game was Bournemouth, and they're in the Premier League now, mm -hmm. and they were a very good uh, lower team. I think they might have been League One at the time. And we got to play. You know, if you tie in the FA Cup, if you tie, you go and play the away game. If you win that yeah. game at home, then you don't no longer have to play for a second game. So we had to play uh, Bournemouth, which was the first team. And I just got into England. I've been there probably for, like, no more than a week. And the coach kind of tells me, like, yeah, we're going to probably have you train for a month, and then we're going to play you in a game. Uh, come as a sub, probably. Well, the game a week later, we played Bournemouth in the FA Cup, and he started me. And I'm like, "Oh, I thought you said, <laughs> I thought you said we're gonna wait a month." And he's like, "No, no, this is a great opportunity for you to get in shape." So he started. A, a lot of the guys that haven't been playing that much. Uh, we ended up tying the game in at Wigan. So now we had to go all the way to Bournemouth down south of England and play them over there. And we had a game in between weeks. So uh, Wigan being a smaller team, you know, it gets very. Uh, you don't have a as many players as the big team, Man City, Man United, you have three teams in there. So we had definitely 
uh, you know, didn't have many uh, legs. We had a lot of tired legs and we had to fly all the way south of England and pay them. And we ended up winning the game and we just kept going and he just kept switching the team. So there was games that I had to play in the Premier League that I didn't play in the, in the FA Cup. So he just kept switching teams. And when he got to later stages, that's when he started playing the, the more starting team. And it was difficult because we, was, we were also fighting for relegation. Uh, being a lower team in England, that's the case most of the time. And so that got very difficult, but we still kept doing well. We went to later stages until we got to uh, play um, Everton at Everton. Um, and we knew that was, hey, that was the quarterfinals at the time. And, and uh, if you go to the semifinals, that's where you start playing semifinals at Wembley. And being from a small town in, in England, where Wigan is from, uh, north of Manchester, uh, the whole town wants to wants to go to wants to go to Wembley. That's like going to Madison Square Garden in America and playing there the any NCAA tournament or any NBA games or any concerts at the end of the day or even bigger over there. So everybody at Wigan just started putting all the pressure on the players that hey we want to go and half of the state at uh, Everton, which is about 20, 20 to twenty five minutes away from Wigan, was all Wigan fans. We ended up winning the game 3-0. And in the semifinals, we were able to play, um, it was Millwall. And Millwall fans, I can tell you right now, <laughs> they're not the nicest fans. <laughs> so Wigan fans were definitely not excited uh, that we had drawn them because there was going to be fights all over the stadium. Uh, they're known for the club that gets in trouble in England most of the time. I think there's a movie, Hooligans. Pretty much. Hooligans. Yeah. yeah, and so about Millwall, uh, they're ruthless people, ruthless fans, and uh, which is great. They support their team, but sometimes it gets into a lot of violent uh, events. So we had to play them in the semis, which at the same time, Everton being a Premier League, a mid-table team, seems to be a lot harder than what Millwall, which was in the championship at the time. Uh, but we didn't get the, the tougher draw, which was – I think it was Man City and Arsenal in the other semifinals. So we were glad we didn't get that one. We, had a, we thought we had a bigger chance to get to the finals. And, yeah, that was the case. We played uh, Millwall. I can't remember if we beat them in the regular game or if it was overtime, but it was 1-0 the game. And uh, Man City, as we know, ended up beating uh, Arsenal. I think it was in the semis. And we... We're scared at the end of the day, you know, hey, we got Man City. Um, mm -hmm. And I think about a few weeks later, uh, you know, we were fighting relegation and we knew we were in the finals. And after the finals, we had to go to Arsenal. And that was the last two games of the season. And we had in the finals. And you also had to win the three days later, the, the game against Arsenal uh, at the, uh, sorry, at the um, Emirates Stadium. And, but let's get to the finals. Finals is that uh, we couldn't believe we were there. Uh, we knew that we were going to play uh, a very tough team. And, but at the same time, we were playing amazing. Uh, as at the time, Wigan was one of the teams that uh, everybody liked watching in England. Uh, a lot of possession uh, game we played. Um, you know, most of the games we dominated in possession. But Man City did too. Um, but, you know... Props to our coach, Roberto Martinez, who knew tactically how to play Man City the whole week, pretty much put the game down to us and said, hey, listen, this is how they're going to play exactly. If you do this, you're going to win the game no matter what. Um, he ended up playing a 3-5-2, and I was actually playing as a left wing. Uh, the whole season, pretty much, I've been playing as a, as a midfielder. And this game somehow said, hey, you're going to play against – Milner and Navas here, and you're going to push up high and pressure, pressure Milner. Um, and that way you keep them back there and they don't push up high. Uh, the, whole, the whole game, we played a pretty good possession game. Went to double overtime. Uh, ben Watson, who's been injured the entire uh, half of the season uh, with the broken leg, uh, got back just for that game pretty much. You know, just... Uh, um, I think it must have been his first game playing. They put him in as a sub. Wow. L last, last corner kick uh, of the double overtime. Uh, 
he just got subbed. I'm pretty sure he just got subbed, and it was a it was a corner kick, and I can't remember who hit the corner kick. I'm not. Uh, I can't recall, but one end and just hit it in, and it was like a minute left. Ended up winning the game, and it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. I I mean I don't think I ever had talked about it before, like you're saying, Nate. Uh, it's the first time I'm talking about this game. Usually soccer just goes so fast that you know you mm-hmm. get the chance to to talk about it. I mean, the season finished. I uh, had to go to a national team, and it was just – you never really talk about it. Soccer just keeps going, and then the offseason, I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to go on vacation. <laughs> so this is the first time really we, we are talking about this, but um, the euphoria, the celebration, all those three days was crazy. I don't think uh, – the town, the ownership, they didn't care if we got relegated at the end of the day. We knew they just wanted to celebrate. And it was the biggest thing um, that the club has ever accomplished. And not many clubs in in the uh, English Premier League or second division or third division uh, have accomplished. So uh, definitely winning is going down in history of one of the teams that has won, especially one of the biggest upset in English football. Um, that... Um, gets to win that tournament so yeah that's pretty much the recap it went pretty fast but yeah i've got false but i don't want to hog it all so ali what what do you got well i just want to know because you talk about this fan base and you know you've only ever played for sporting kansas city but how would you compare that fan base and that celebration to others that you've seen whether that be the Chiefs super bowl parade the royals winning the world series and, I mean, you weren't here when Sporting won MLS Cup, but how would you compare just so fans listening can try to get an idea of what it was like celebrating with that fan base? Yeah, technically it's winning the Super Bowl in England. Um, <laughs> it's just that England is a lot smaller country and the population is a lot smaller too. So uh, Wigan winning is not a, it's not a big town, but it's, it's, it was a thousand, thousand of people in the celebration. Um, we just do it a little different. It's a double-decker bus. Uh, the top is off. It's convertible top, pretty much, if you say. And all the players are on the top, and you just go in the bus, and people just lines off the streets of Wigan. Um, and celebration lasted for a few hours uh, and even days to come. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if you compare, it's a little bit like the Super Bowl of England. Uh, but it's kind of hard because you also have the Premier League there. But uh, this is the oldest tournament in the world, I think. And, and, and it, it's something that English people take very serious. Um, the FA uh, puts a lot of money, a lot of thought into it. Um, and, yeah, it was, it's crazy. It, it's people still wigging. I mean, every day I get tagged about something. Every time it comes <laughs> up, every time I get tagged into something, texts from friends. Uh, uh, you know, or Wigan um, sends me text people from the staff all the time. Uh, you know, we definitely went down in history and it's always be remembered uh, for a town that's very small. It's technically, you know, it's, it's different here, but you have a, a professional team in Kansas City and Lee Summit, Overland Park and mm-hmm. North of the River. And that's how it goes. And it's just competition between all these, all these teams. And so Wigan is definitely always the... Um, remembering all the other cities about that because it's very hard. I mean, you only have Liverpool and uh, Man City, Man United, Arsenal, Chelsea. You, you can only name a few big teams that have won this. Yeah, like you said, it's going down as one of the biggest upsets. You're right. It is the oldest competition. That was the 132nd edition of the FA Cup. That's pretty incredible. Okay. Um, I didn't even know that. <laughs> quick question. I, I, have you seen on Netflix The Beautiful Game, I think is what it's called? It's, uh, I have not. It's about the FA Cup and the start of the FA. It's, uh, I watched it. It's, I think it's the creators of Downton Abbey. Um, mm-hmm. So it's a little dramatic. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen Downton Abbey, but I have a feeling this is pretty, pretty much, there's a lot of love in it as well. But the, the soccer part was pretty cool. And with your FA Cup background, I think, uh, I think you might, might enjoy it. Um, I'm definitely going to watch that now. I mean, I have a lot of time. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. I want to go back to that, to the upset uh, part of it. And just to the game itself, I'm going to read off some of the players that, that played for Man City on the day. Uh, Joe Hart and goal, but Pablo Zabaleta, Vincent Company, 
David Silva, Yaya Toure, Samir Nasri, Sergio Aguero, Carlos Tevez. Um, what do you remember uh, kind of about your matchups individually on the field and, and maybe seeing the team sheet and maybe just walking out uh, at Wembley uh, with, a, with a full crowd for an FA Cup final, like you said, one of the biggest days in the year in England? Yeah, you just remind me of something. It's actually Savaleta as, as a right back, and Milner came in as a second half sub from Navas. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I couldn't remember much watching other FA Cups, and I didn't remember uh, the whole thing that goes in the background. So, I mean, you can't really tell cause some in the locker room stuff, but the whole setup, uh, getting to the stadium, and and just there's no games in England at that time. The only game. Um, in England at the time is just the FA Cup. So the entire country is pretty much watching you. And that's why I said earlier, is it like the Super Bowl? Because it's the only game going on in England and they set it up that way. So everybody watches this. I mean, the, the uh, royal family is there. So you get to shake everybody's hand at the end of the game if you win. So I got to shake the entire royal family. So uh, hand at the end and lift the, the trophy, right? But leading up to the game, I mean, just walking out and they put the red carpet and you walk out to the field, that whole thing is so emotional. And on the side that we get to face uh, the fans, it was the side where uh, the Wigan fans were at. So that was, that was great. And behind us was the Man City fans. So all you could think is just, oh, this is just Wigan people here. So it's great. You get to see them and you feel like you're playing at home pretty much. And I, I just remember that and in England, there's no national anthem. There's nothing. You just get out to the field and you play. You don't have time to think. You just get out there right away and referees call you and you take the picture and it's quick and it's just probably two minutes and you're out playing. So you don't get time to think and get nervous. You just start the game. Um, the matchups, yeah. So like I was saying, I was playing as a left wing pretty much. So I had a uh, – we're playing with the line at three, so I pretty much had a, a, a center back protecting me all the time. So I was free to go up high and pressure Savaleta. And Savaleta's a guy that love going up high and Navas like to go inside. So that created a lot of difficulties for the guys in the middle because Man City overcrowded in the middle all the time. And so by me pressuring up high to Savaleta, um, and that's why I think I played that position because he wanted a more defensive type of player but also can attack the coach. So me going to Savaleta the entire time, I kept him up there. So the our center back only had to worry if they hit the ball over the top over me, then he was there to protect me. Uh, he ended up being that way. The game ended up playing that way. And um, the center back ended up pretty much shutting down um, Navas, Jesus Navas, which he was at the time probably the best right midfielder in the Premier League. And so they sub Milner, which was a harder worker than Navas was. Uh, but didn't have the type of skills as Navas. And that created a little difficult for me. So I had to drop a little bit. But by the time I had dropped already, Savaleta was already a bit tired, a little winded. And that's when, uh, you know, we were able to figure out the game. And vice versa on the other side, uh, um, uh, Clichy for Man City was a more uh, defensive left back. Uh, we put a young guy who was unbelievable, who was up and coming, uh, 19-year-old for Wigan who was fast and very skillful. Um, and the other guy on the other side, I think might have been uh, shoot, either Kunawero or Tevez. Mm -hmm. mm. And so that made Kunawero defend a little more. And that's how we were able to, you know, tactically their front three, which was Kunawero, Tevez, and was it Kunawero, Tevez. Nasri was in the, in the game, yeah, in Nasri. Uh, that created a lot of trouble, but they had to defend a lot of the game, and that ended up helping us more. And I think the game was broken down there on the sides from that point of view. And, you know, I think that's what gives us the victory at the end of the day. Uh, but the matchups were there, and, uh, you know, props to our coach who was able to uh, see the game from that perspective. And, um, you know, it's a pretty interesting game. If you, I never have watched the game. Um, I only watch highlights, but I want to watch. Every time I ask for the, for the tape of Wigan, they said, yeah, we'll send it. They only send, like, clips, but they never send the actual game. So, Nate, 
find that game for me. Yeah, make we'll get it on happen, that. Man. Yeah, we got to find that. Give him a full game it. record. You you know, yeah, I, I need to, yeah. <laughs> I want to watch that whole game, and I want to see if you put any good tackles on Samir Nasri because he might have been my most hated player in uh, in England for a long time. I did not like him at all. So, remember, did, did you, <laughs> well, did he was you, unbelievable did, player. Yeah. Did you get yeah, any yeah. any tackles in on him? You remember? Are you an Arsenal fan or something? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. Yeah. Got him. That's why. Yeah, no. Uh, I, I think he was on the other side. He never came to my side, really. Uh, I was um, mostly also defending uh, Silva, who was in the oh, middle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he was coming on my side a lot. They're trying to overcrowd our side. And I tackled him a few times. Um, some battles with Milner. Um, Navas was more guy that uh, wanted to dribble you and pass and do one too, so it was hard to get to him. Um, but yeah, uh, he wasn't on my side as much. But uh, yeah, I gotta watch the game again. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to Roger to think a long about time it. Yeah. Ago, man. Yeah. yeah, one of the one of like the highest points of contention when talking about this game though is that the goal actually came after Pablo Zabaleta had been sent off for a second yellow card. Do you remember that? How do you feel about that decision? Was it as controversial as you may have thought it was in the moment? What was your take? If you watch the game, that's a, that's a red card. 100% red card. Uh, it should have been a straight red, I think. But he already had a yellow card. And I think he could have gotten yellow cards earlier in the game, um, too. And what should have been off, sent off. Uh, but, I mean, we were all into the game and we didn't care what the referee's calls were. We were just playing the game and we were not going to worry about the referee. Uh, but, yeah, he, he gets a red card uh, late in the game. Um, and that definitely made him make some changes. Him being a right back uh, made some changes into the game. And we definitely had some opportunities to finish the game. It didn't happen. He came in a corner kick. Uh, at the end, but yeah, good call. I, I totally forgot that he had gotten a red card and uh, actually has been one of the good players, bright spots for their team. And that definitely hurt them a lot. Uh, I think I made him tired and and um, both teams were tired at the end of the day, but you lose one guy, even if there's five minutes left, it, it's definitely gonna, gonna hurt you. And then the, in, in the corner kick, uh, they were definitely outnumbered and we were uh, the team that wanted the most at the end of the day. Last question about the FA Cup before we get to Carter's goals to Google for you. Uh, you mentioned getting to shake the hand of the royal family. So I, I'll admit, I'm, I'm not a big royal family <laughs> guy. I don't really understand the whole fascination with it. But uh, my wife is into a, into a big time. Like when, whenever like one of the royals gets, I don't know what happens to them when they get knighted or you know, they become a uh, – whatever that happens to them. They, they, my, my, my wife and her mom put on the hats and they, they watch it on TV. They, they get super excited about that stuff. Um, and, I, and she tells me that there's all these rules about how you are or are not allowed to address the queen when you, when you can't talk to her. She has to talk to you first. Do, do, do they give you any rules or anything like that? Or is it just like, hey, go up and shake hands with them? How, how did that go down? No, they didn't give – we just started going up the stairs. You know, you go up the stairs like a little and you come back the, you come back the other side. Uh, but they're just waiting for you in line right there. And you just pretty much uh, – shake everybody's hands on the way up. I mean, you get to shake the royal family, some other important people, some other important figures in English football. Uh, so uh, past FA Cup winners, um, FA Cup presidents. And uh, so, no, they didn't give you any rules of how you should do this. You just shake the hands. Uh, you just make sure you just – Take the hand. You won't go strong on some people and go strong on other people. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, you're just so excited. You don't know. You just yeah. you've been hugging people. You, yeah. you know, I was hugging everybody. Yeah, uh, I was just excited to get up there. Yeah. Hey, if you if you win the FA Cup, maybe all the rules go out the window. You know, you're you're an FA Cup champ at that point. Carter, you've got this this idea. I think it's great. We're going to be talking about it ourselves too. So how about you fire up? We'll let Roger be the first one to uh, to give us something to, to do here. Some homework. All right, yeah. Uh, let's start off with a good one, Roger. No pressure. Um, just kind of, we're all sitting at home and um, hoping everyone is well, but thinking of some ways to to uh, spend some of our time. And I think everyone's got, I mean, what's better than a, a highlight in soccer than a goal highlight? And I think everyone's got some favorites over the years. So I was thinking of uh, compiling a list of goals to Google for people. And uh, it can be one from your career, 
it or it can just be a, a favorite one but maybe just give us a, a goal and what what why it's significant to you and uh and let's see if people go and go and google it check it out well there's definitely plenty of goals um lucky enough to remember let's see about four world cups i watched and there was a lot of goals uh champions league and some tournament throughout the years uh international tournaments and Shoot, I'm a left-footed, so I'm always loving when left-footed guys score some nice goals. So a goal that I would always remember, I was watching this game, uh, and this is probably the two best national teams at, at the time. Uh, they actually ended up playing against each other in 98 uh, World Cup Finals, which is between France and, and Brazil. Um, but I'm not sure it was a year earlier uh, and Roberto Carlos hit a hit a free kick, I don't know, almost 40 yards out. It looks like it's 40 yards out. And he hits it with almost the outside of his foot. And you can see, like, the gravity of the ball going out and somehow just comes back in and scores this unbelievable goal. Uh, many people won't remember. Many people weren't born. Uh, many people weren't watching soccer as much in the United States. Uh, but if they get to see this goal, it's an it's, uh, unbelievable goal. Um, the other goal that stuck to me, it was, um, it was a Champions League final. Uh, and it was actually an assist by Roberto Carlos. So here you go. It's an assist by Roberto Carlos. And the goal was scored by a right-footed with his left. And it was a volley by Sinedine Sidan against Leverkusen in the Champions League final. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, you know, you can't, you know, uh, distance technique was better than anybody in the world at the time. Uh, it's probably one, a few people that can do that right there. And he did it with his not strong foot, which was his left. And it was an amazing goal. Um, and those are our goals that stuck to me, but there's unbelievable goals that, I mean, you can argue too when Maradona in the 86 World Cup, when he dribbled up on the middle of the field all the way uh, in score. Um, shoot, there's a uh, four lines goal in the World Cup in 2010, I guess. I mean, I was in that World yeah. Cup, but I can't remember if it was 10 or 6. Uh, <laughs> when he chested and then he volleyed it. So, those are some goals to remember. But yeah, definitely those two that I said earlier uh, are goals that uh, stuck to me for sure. <laughs> Okay, Roger, I'll give you one real quick before we let you go uh, because it's a goal that uh, is very near and dear to my heart. Did you know that uh, you scored the first goal that I ever got to call as a play-by-play -play guy, as the actual play-by-play -play guy for Sporting Kansas City? Really? Yeah. What's, uh, when was you play-by-play -play call? 2015 at oh, FC I, Dallas. At uh, Dallas. Benny says, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That was uh, – and it was, it was from long range, too, outside the penalty area. So people should go back watch. Yeah. March 14th, 2015. That was my first ever goal yeah. call. Hmm. So. Awesome. <laughs> Do you have a favorite one from Sporting Kansas City, your time of sporting that you scored that people should look up? Uh, let's see. Against, I guess against uh, LAFC. Uh, against LAFC and the yeah. 20, 2018 yeah. uh, last game of this regular season and that was yep. the winner of that game would pretty much gonna uh take first in the western conference mm -hmm. um roger was, that was uh, my no. favorite goal that was my favorite goal of yours because i had shown up at halftime i was covering there was a chiefs game that day i believe the game was on a sunday and i showed up at halftime and i'm like rushing to grab all my things trying to sprint from the parking lot to the stadium and all of a sudden it's right before halftime when you scored correct yeah absolutely. i think it was right yep. before and i hear just yeah. like the entire stadium erupt and i like i was like dang it something yep. happened for sure and i checked my phone it was like roger espinosa it was so cool so <laughs> yeah, i had to go so, back and watch yeah. it i didn't get to see it live yeah. But. yeah yeah so yeah so that was the goal just because uh at that moment uh it meant something to the team and it's kind of sent a message to lafc at the time right there uh being away from home uh, I think it made it tough for them, and especially that goal. Um, definitely got the team going. So I uh, uh, definitely uh, think that uh, that was – and it was a nice goal, so that's why I uh, I think that was one of the best goals here uh, in Sporting Kansas City. 
All right. Well, hey, Roger, thank you so much for the time. We really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, keep enjoying those jogs down to the crossroads and back. And hopefully we'll be talking uh, sporting Kansas City season soccer when we get back with you here pretty soon. Absolutely. Thank you. And, uh, and happy birthday, stairs. by the way, to uh, Chulo. <laughs> yeah, he's somewhere out here. <laughs> he was nice he's and quiet excited, the whole yeah, show, yeah. too. Yeah. Good boy. He started barking right before you guys. He started barking. <laughs> like, Chulo, you cannot do that right now. <laughs> well, he's, he's MVP today. That's Roger yeah. Espinosa. That's going to do it for us on this edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show. We're going to keep doing this. Uh, you get to watch it on video now. You get to listen on Sports Radio 810 WHB as well. And we'll see you next week.